Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Beth Dolan. I'm the Dean of the College of Health at Lehigh University. Um, we're excited that you joined us for um, this talk in our series on disability independence or disability health equity. Um, I wanna acknowledge our partners in sponsoring this colloquium series. Um, so with thanks to the Office of Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences, the Institute for Health Policy and Politics in the College of Health, and for the first time, an external partner, the Good Shepherd Rehabilitation Network. So the College of Health uh, mission, very broadly put, is to improve health outcomes for populations, communities, and individuals through health and education. To get a little bit more specific about a particular research cluster that we're building, um, that research cluster focuses on disability health equity, which we're calling disability independence for now. Um, the goal of the research cluster is to advance the equity, well-being, agency, and community success of people of all ages with disabilities. In this effort, we're following the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health definition of disability, which includes mobility and physical disabilities, spinal cord injuries, head or traumatic brain injury, vision, hearing, cognitive, learning, psychological, and invisible disabilities. So together, an interdisciplinary team of College of Health researchers working in collaboration with people with disabilities, um, our colleagues in the College of Engineering and Education, and external partners like Good Shepherd Rehab will create or apply technology designed to support more independence and thriving. Building on existing faculty expertise and community-based participatory research, health technology, data science, health policy, and epidemiology, we are recruiting additional colleagues in the following three areas focused on people with disabilities. First, assistive technology and data science. Second, community health and the multiple determinants of health. And three, disability law policy and ethics. So we invite you um, to enjoy this talk um, and feel free to post questions in the Q&A as we go. Um, we'll address them, Dr. Holloway, our guests will address them at the end. So right now I want to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Eduardo Gomez, who is both a professor in the Department of Community and Population Health and the director of the Institute for Health Policy um, and Politics. So um, Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Dean Dolan, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited about our, our event today. Um, the colloquium um, the, of co the College of Health Colloquium speaker series started back in the summer of 2020. It was an uh, effort to bring together international and domestic health policy uh, epidemiological experts to talk on a variety of uh, health issues. And we really seek to find uh, the best, most cutting edge experts on a variety of topics from women's health to nutrition. And uh, this semester, our focus is on disability independence. And today we're honored to have with us as a guest speaker, uh, Professor Kathy Holloway from UCL University College London. Uh, professor Holloway is a professor of interaction design and innovation at UCL's Interaction Center and the academic director and co-founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. GDI Hub exists to accelerate disability innovation for a fairer world. And Kathy's research um, revolves around supporting this aim. GDI Hub is part of a partnership which has grown out of the Paralympic legacy and crosses traditional discipline boundaries to pool expertise to tackle the issues faced by society in realizing the sustainable development goals. Professor Holloway has recently created the new in undisciplined the new Undisciplined of Disability Interaction, DIX, which takes an issue-based design approach drawing on specific disciplinary methods as and when required to create solutions for dis disabled people globally. Using the DIX approach, Professor Holloway is tackling a number of research questions, both big and small. Prior to joining UCL, Professor Ka uh, Holloway worked as a research and development engineer for Medtronic. She is also a director and co-founder of two social enterprises, Movement Metrics and the GDI Hub Community Interest Company. And today she will give, be giving a lecture titled this, uh, Global Disability Innovation. 
So if all of you could please um, post your questions uh, in the chat, uh, the uh, question box you have in front of you, and then I will be moderating the questions at the end. Um, and thank you very much, Professor Holloway. Um, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, let's share my screen. I just need you to stop sharing. Someone needs to stop sharing. Uh, so that's okay. All right, there we go. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, we bring the Q&A chat back up. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, as I'm, uh, it's an honor to be talking to you. It's lovely to, to be here and, and to start this conversation with you all. I, I think the initiative that you've got for the cloakroom and also your new interest in disability independence, uh, and it could even be disability interdependence, is, um, is an excellent one. And so I titled the talk Global Disability Innovation because that's the journey that myself and my co-founders of the Global Disability Innovation Hub have been on since 2016. So I'm hoping to give you a, a flavor of what we're doing. Um, it's, it's now grown into quite a big thing and, and it's, it's always a challenge sometimes to put things uh, into a, a relatively short presentation, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the types of things to do in case you're interested in doing more of the same. So, what is GDI Hub? Well, GDI Hub is a research and practice centre which is driving disability innovation for a fairer world. It's based at University College London, but we're now operational in 41 countries with more than 70 partners and we've reached 29 million people since we launched in 2016. And so you heard that I am both a professor at UCL, but I'm also a co-founder of what we call GDI Hub Community Interest Company. And so we have these two, two sides of the coin. One is academic research and, and innovation, and the other is policy and practice, which, which sits within the CIC, the Community Interest Company, which is a not-for-profit type organization within, within the UK. And so how do we explain the concept of disability innovation? And, and you heard I worked at Medtronic. Uh, I, I left Medtronic. I came to UCL. I did a PhD. I did a PhD between the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, which uh, centered in spinal cord injury, and I set up the wheelchair biomechanics unit there. Um, and then, uh, but also with civil engineering, because we were trying to understand the biomechanics of wheelchair propulsion in outdoor environments. And that first spin out that I had, Movement Metrics, wasn't a particularly successful spin out, but it was my PhD sensors to measure biomechanics in, in outdoor environments. Um, and like anybody who does any sort of spin out innovation work, you, you normally fail the first time around and you learn a lot. And I suppose my second uh, spin out was this global disability innovation uh, hub. And so we explain the idea of disability innovation as, so we're gonna talk about is what is disability innovation? What is the desired impact of disability innovation and how we do this disability innovation? That's sort of the talk in a nutshell. Um, and how we do disability innovation is it's more than a product service or policy. So we talk to people, it doesn't matter if it's the World Bank, UNICEF, a small charity, uh, you know, people who are putting together a new master's course. We're talking about a new way of thinking to try and shift the agenda to mainstream delivery partners towards fairer future societies and communities. And we like to push the boundaries towards maximal inclusion. So we don't go by what the governments in the country are saying or what the policy says. It doesn't matter what the ADA says, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that should be almost the starting point. And we should be you know, way beyond that. I know we're not, but we should be way beyond it. So we're trying to push those boundaries uh, in all directions in every conversation that we have. We think of it as part of a much bigger movement for the idea of disability justice, uh, which must disrupt current ideas and practices to sort of create new possibilities. And, and we believe a fairer world is one without ba barriers to participation within an inclusive and environmentally sustainable society. So our disability innovation journey actually started from the London 2012 uh, Olympics and Paralympics. So this is uh, the, camp our, the campus that I now work on for UCL is on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. But if you imagine when you came out of the stadium at the end of the closing ceremony of the Olympics, all of the billboards said, thanks for the warm up. Thank you, Olympics. You've done an excellent job of setting the stage for the main event, which is the Power Olympics. Now, that was a massive shift because when the Power Olympics was first, when the British public were first asked, would you buy a ticket to the Power Olympics? Less than 1% of people said yes. And yet, when we launched London 2012, we had more Power Olympics power athletes from more countries than ever before the stadiums were full and history was made and so the stadium it was a phenomenal time to live in London it was it changed if you worked in the world of disability the the movement that the energy around disability inclusion disability independence as, as you might be calling it just radically shifted I reckon we went 50 years in in the four years it took to put on the Olympics and Paralympics like before when I talked about 
disability inclusion, nobody cared, literally nobody cared. And now I'm being invited to you know, government away things like central central government are asking for advice. That did not happen before the Power Olympics. So we had this new momentum of disability innovation movement, and we wanted to figure out how do we keep this going? So in 2016, the team behind the 2012 legacy joined top academic institutions led by UCL to launch the GDI hub. Now, I'm really lucky that I can talk about the Le London legacy uh, movement, the Paralympic legacy movement. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I was a, just a lowly academic that had just got tenure at UCL. But UCL was about to become the anchor tenant of a massive new bit of regeneration of East London. It was going to take out a loan of a few hundred million pounds. It was going to build a 680 million pound campus. And the then Dean of Engineering said, anybody with tenure can put forward ideas for what should go into this new centre. And I said, well, it'd be nice to have a centre where we co-designed assistive technologies because I was sick of going to transport engineers and transport or environmental engineers saying, oh, the medical people should fix things. They should give better wheelchairs. And then you go to you know, wheelchair companies and wheelchair companies think, well, it's too difficult because the environment's too hard. And it didn't matter who you spoke to, disability, it doesn't matter if it's inclusive education, health policy, health health innovation. Everybody thought it was sort of somebody else's problem and it kept falling between the cracks. So I thought we should bring everyone together. I was lucky enough to be introduced to Victoria Austin and Ian McKinnon, my co-founders and co-directors. Vicky was the head of the Paralympic Legacy and Sport uh, for London 2012, and Ian had been in charge of the built environments and making sure it was inclusive both before games times and after games times. And the three of us had this conversation on a tube train, actually, <laughs> um, in a lab, which I was running at the time. And we thought, wow, maybe if we join forces, we could do, because what universities do really well is research and evidence and teaching. But what they had done really well was practice based things. So what if we could scale that globally? So we took our lessons. We spent a year or so planning what would GDI Hub be? And, and, and these are sort of our principles that we thought this is what we learned from the 2012 Paralympics. We can't do it alone. You know, three people aren't going to change the world. We need a way to chart our progress, because if you're not able to point to those numbers, like I can say we've, we've reached 29 million people because every single engagement we have, we, we capture right from the very start. We knew we had to have partnerships and they, you know, you need to build trust and inclusion in those partnerships matters. So we have to have people with disabilities or disabled people at the table in each of the partnerships and building trust, especially between actors that don't trust each other is, is difficult, but it has to be done. We must have leadership by the people most expect, affected, but also by those that know the answers. And the people who know the answers are normally people with disabilities. We just don't often ask them or we don't include them at the right moments. And we need these milestones to build momentum. So we, we set milestones from the very, very start to build this momentum and investment. And we built those often around cultural engagement um, points. So, for example, we've got Paris coming up. Great. Before we had Tokyo. When Tokyo was happening, we bought, we negotiated the television rights for the first time for Africa for free for view for um, the Paralympics. So 27 territories in Africa got access to the Paralympics for free and they wouldn't have had it without our intervention of negotiating those television rights. Now, that was a massive spike. We had a research program wrapped around that, but that cultural engagement point gave us this momentum change within the within the continent of Africa. So everything we do is in partnership. The top left corner, um, for those that uh, might not be able to see it, is a picture of some students around and students, uh, that's our master's programme in disability design and innovation. Even that is in partnership. It's taught across three universities, although it's a UCL uh, led degree. The top right is our first uh, assistive technology accelerator in Africa, which we co-designed with AMREF uh, International. The bottom right is the Gates community, which is at, at uh, the World Health Organization, where we work very intensely with the WHO and UNICEF to try and make sure that they have the tools and, and, and research that they need in order to build policy and practice at that, that top level. And the bottom left is a picture of people waving, which is um, taken in, um, in Indonesia, and it's one of our inclusive design uh, projects, so the built environment projects. So we have developed this 12-step model, which uh, went back to London 2012, and we tried to figure out what makes a good disability inclusion model. And actually, in the first iteration of this, which was proposed by us, and then you know we, we were shown it was incorrect uh, when we had continued when we uh, finished the the data and evidence. The first thing we thought was political leadership. We thought political leadership, big P, small P, that's what you need. 
because if you don't have that, it's very difficult to, to have change. But actually, when we went back to interview people who were involved in the Paralympics um, legacy, we found that there was a step before that. And that was the community leaders articulation of needs and priorities. So actually, the political leadership needed to know what to do. And where they found out what to do was the community leaders had were able to and given the opportunity to articulate what was needed and what their priorities were. These were then taken up both by people with a big P and a small P in terms of political leadership and built into a clear mission and joint objective setting for numbers one and two together. So you get the community leaders together, you get the political leadership together, you get that joint objective setting. You're, you're about to deliver the Paralympics, it can't be late, so you've got time limited action. You've also then got governance by disabled people and community leaders. An example of that is that on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, Nothing could be built, nothing, without um, a without it going through the Built Environment Access Panel, which was a group of disabled people or persons with disability who had been trained in um, access, in, in, in all of the access laws of, of, um, of the UK. And therefore, they got veto rights over any building. So if they didn't believe it had reached the um, accessibility laws, it was not allowed to go through. So it wasn't a case of we, you know, we might ask them for an opinion. It was that if they, if people didn't think it, it reached it, it couldn't be built. It went back to the drawing board and had to come back to the beep panel for approval. We also had diverse partnerships. You saw that when within the um, London Paralympics and the Olympics, when they they hired in teams, so they had um, gender, religion, all of the protected characteristics were uh, quotas and instead of hiring individually they tried to hire in a group so that each team would have access to local communities that could be drawn upon to make sure that everybody around the olympics and paralympics felt included you then need expert expert technical assistance and mainstream training because not everybody understands disability inclusion you need to build resource uh, resources resourcefulness and tools try and inclusive innovation being encouraged just get people to to put forward their ideas Get good enough data. We can kill ourselves sometimes trying to get the best data, especially as academics, but actually good enough data to make decisions is all you need. We built a culture of excellence. So it was beyond contractual compliance. Contractual compliance is not something we like to think about in GDI Hub. That's just like some sort of baseline that we, we build upon um, and allow people to, you know, uh, like try things. But if, the, if things fail, if you fail to comply with the law or you fail to comply with that idea of disability inclusion, then there must be consequences to that failure. And finally, make sure that you reflect and recognize success because I, anybody who works in disability space and disability movement, oftentimes we're running and running and running and we stop to, to check on, on how well we have done. So I'm going to move on quite quickly to say that overall, we try and spark transformative outcomes by doing things differently. So we've now reached 24, 29 million people, more than 41 countries, with the first WHO collaborating centre on AT. We work across these themes, so assistive and accessible technology, inclusive design of the built environment, culture and participation, climate and resilience, and inclusive educational tech. Climate and resilience might stand out, but in effect, most disabled people or persons with disability live in uh, very low resource settings, which are mostly most affected by climate change. So we're trying to build an inclusive climate sustainability agenda with uh, people globally. And then we work across research, innovations, programs, teaching and advocacy. And I'm just going to show you a quick video of one of the advocacy videos that we helped to lead on before I go in to speak about our major program, AT2030, with a couple of case studies to sort of pull out some of the research and innovation that we do. We have checked this and you could hear it before, but hopefully. You're such an inspiration. So brave. You remind me to be happy. I love that you don't let it get you down. Good for you. Breaks my heart. Look at you out and about. You push us all to do better. You are superheroes. Really? Yeah, we're superheroes, all right. We're getting the kids out the door on time. We push strollers. Here's on El Pasadino. We break phones. But there's nothing special about us. We have more regions. Can house plants. Watch reality TV. <laughs> Pretend we're watching reality TV. We're a lesson with two mates. Get sunburn on holiday. We're politicians and lobsters. <laughs> Pension advisors. We, we get, get married. We met on a blind date. <laughs> <laughs> and we can laugh at ourselves too. We love our grannies. And our gogos. We pray five times a day. And no, I'm not praying for a cure. I'm praying for a new handbag. We swipe right. We go on first dates. And get lucky too. 
so why the pedestals are nice. And the pity tolerated. We're not special. That's not what it's like. Non è la nostra realtà. And only when you see us. <laughs> Wonderfully ordinary. Wonderfully human. Only then. Can we all break down these barriers? That keep us apart. <laughs> So, hopefully that gave you a flavour of some of the some of the sort of advocacy that we try and do, because especially in some geographies where we work, uh, it's though it's most important to change attitudes before we can get anything moving. So, one of the big flagship programmes that we have is a programme called Assistive Technology 2030. Um, and it's based on the investment, based on the case that if you invest in assistive technology, you should get a $9 to $1 gain um, as it brings access to, to health, to community and to the economy. But um, we don't we don't get those people. 90 percent of people don't have access to assistive technology globally. Um, and so that 90 percent of people who don't have access is despite the fact that disability is part of the human condition. And almost everyone will be temporarily or permanently impaired at some point in life. So any of us that are living beyond the age of 40 are beginning to find that, I don't know, our eyesight gets worse, our hearing gets worse, we're not able to run as fast, but we'll begin to get pain in various places. And so our functions are going to be impaired and we will need assistive technology in order to live for lives. Yet, as I just said, one in three people, 2.5 billion people need assistive technology and 90% of people don't have access. So assistive products are the products, I'm sure this you already know this, but we like to just make sure it's really clear. Assistive products, it might be a prosthetic limb, it might be access to braille, it might be a wheelchair, it could be a hearing aid, it could be a speech to text device. It's a product. That only becomes a technology according to the World Health Organization when you're actually able to use it. And you're only able to use it if you can procure it or it be procured for you, it's provided to you. You're able to be trained on it, um, it can be repaired. And, and as your needs change, that it would be updated or, or assessed. And that is often not the case. We get a lot of cases where technology is given to people and it doesn't, it's not fit for purpose. And that leads to high abandonment rates. So in, in high in, countries like the United States of America or UK, we have abandonment rates of up to 80% for assistive technology. The standard figure within the European Union is 30%. We expect a third of assistive technologies or products to be abandoned. But disabled people are more likely to be poor or just persons with disability if you're in the US, and poverty increases the chance of being a disabled person. And that leads to this real problem, which is that there is a massive need in low resource settings phenomenal need for assistive product and yet 90% don't have access and that's so there's no demand in the market there's literally no demand because nobody the governments can't afford the assistive products and the training and the assistive technology and the individuals can't afford it so therefore you've got this massive need no demand and therefore failing market and that was the premise for the 80 20 30 program what we what we've completed now is initially it was a nine 10 million pound program after a year they increased it to, to um nine with an extra 9.8 million pounds that's been matched, so it's already a £40 million pound programme. And, and just in, in New York recently, the UN, uh, the UK government announced an additional £31 million into AD2030, which again will be matched, which brings the entire programme to £100 million, pounds, which makes it phenomenal, really, from, from my point of view. I sometimes wake up thinking, am I really, are we really running a £100 million pound programme? But we are. And so we run it under four clusters, uh, data and evidence, innovation, country implementation and capacity and participation. I don't have time to speak about all of them, so I'm just going to quickly mention data and evidence, uh, capacity and participation first, sorry, data and evidence, and a, a couple of examples from innovation. But I can speak to country implementation in the Q&A if you'd like to know more. So within capacity and participation, we want people to be able to participate. And our, our premise is that assistive technologies like wheelchairs can't be used if, if the environment isn't accessible to people. And I know that the last speaker in the cloakroom series you know, spoke about transport equity and, 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 and transport inclusion. And that is part of, of course, inclusive design of the built environment. So Ian, uh, the co-founder of GDI Hub, has said that inclusive design can help all human beings experience the world around them in a fair and equal way. So we have focused on cities. Um, why did we focus on cities for this particular piece of work in 80-2030? Well, partly because 90% of urban growth up to the year 2050 will take place in Asia and Africa. And by 2050, 3.3 billion will live in the cities in Asia. 60% of the infrastructure we will have in 2050 doesn't yet exist. And cities are centers of innovation, cities are not equitable. 
we have massive informal settlements when I go to informal settlements it amazes me that people with disabilities just get by even if they can't see they've got their white cane they're just getting on with their lives um, and the climate crisis is putting increasing strain on cities but it's also putting increasing investment into cities and we want to make sure that investment is inclusive of all people so we've got these six case studies happening within the 80 20 30 program um, in the global south so we're looking at what current policy regulation guidelines or good practice exist what is it like to live with a disability in these cities what does good inclusive infrastructure look like and how can inclusive infrastructure support AT use? And these are the, the country or the cities that we're looking in. We're, look, we're in Medellin in Colombia, Freetown, Sierra Leone, which is in the informal settlement there, Nairobi, Kenya, Varanasi in India, Surakarta in Indonesia and Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. Each of them have different partners. Um, and that's because we need local partners, but also because they have different, um, different uh, objectives, which I could talk through in more detail. So we, we've completed this work, we've nearly finished it actually, and it's about to be released next year in a book, which will be the Global Guidelines on Inclusive Design, Inclusive Infrastructure, sorry. Um, and, and in those, there will also be videos from each city which have been made by people in those cities to explain how the program has helped transform a small part and what that means for their country. Within the data and evidence, uh, uh, cluster we initially the first year we initially had an entire program around stigma return on investment of assistive technology and mission-led innovation across assistive technologies so how you could embed mission-led policy within governments that would support assistive technology we also supported the world report so it was the first global report on assistive technology and we developed a mobile screening tool as well as developing a whole series of uh, systematic reviews and influencing papers so we we'll also do some work on enhancing insights. So we've developed an 80, 20, 30 insights portal, and we're also working on data sets that are sparse to try and make AT information better at a population health level. And finally, we're now doing some work on impact stories um, and community collaboration. So we're helping people who are persons with disability develop their own story and their own community collaboration work. So we now have 150 articles and influencing papers, 64 strategic tools, 97,000 downloads. And there, a lot of those articles were the background for the global report on assistive technology, which you can see that the 80 2030 program, along with AtScale, which is the UN agency for assistive technology, um, we, we sponsored effectively the global report, which was written by the WHO um, and UNICEF. Um, but we also don't, it's not just academic research where we write our papers and we run away. We try to make sure this is given out to the world. So, for example, we were at COP in 20, 20, COP 26. We have GDI Hub Live events where we, it's a little bit like a colloquium event. Where we try to bring partners together about around a topic. We have a Global Disability Summit, which we've just held in person, actually, in, in, in London. Um, once a year where we bring everybody from around the world that we're working with um, and, and we deliver things. Uh, we, we all have like TED style talks, which are all going to be online very soon and our, on our YouTube channel. We have webinars to help people understand the report, like the Mobile Disability Gap Report. Um, we have launches. So, for example, when the Global Report of Insistive Technology was launched, we had a parliamentary launch in the UK. And, and we also um, had, were at COSP15. That's just an example of, of a couple of years of work. And that just also shows you the types of audiences we're trying to engage, whether it be policymakers, other researchers, um, or, or people that uh, might want to, local community uh, engagement activities. One of the examples of um, how we supported the global report was we uh, gave money to the World Health Organization to support the development of the Rapid Assistive Technology Assessment Tool. So the RATA is a household survey tool, which allows you to go door to door and see what the need or the unmet need or the undermet need is for assistive products. Um, they, they developed that, we helped then develop a digital tool of that, and we're now developing a, a further digital tool. So the further digital tool is where UCL and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine have come together. So um, LSHTM in, in the UK are leading population health people that you probably know about. They've done a lot of work on how you measure need, the different survey tools, but they had been going door to door um, in the same way the VATA had been going door to door, paper based survey or even just one mobile phone based survey. And what they wanted to do was say, well, actually, there are now these digital screening tools for eye loss. So you can use Peak to scan your eye and see whether or not you need glasses. You can use a tool called Herex to scan to whether or not you need hearing loss. Oxford University have presented some new checklists for uh, cognitive health. Uh, we have these other checklists for um, physical health, for physical impairments. 
can you please UCL bring all of that together into one survey platform so that we can issue people tablets, they can go door to door. Um, and in Uganda, we have just finishing the data collection of um, a yeah, 45,000 person survey using that new tool and we'll be launching the mobile tool for others to be able to use. So that was data and evidence. Um, and that's always looking at policymakers, to be honest, we're always like trying to get policymakers to, to make, in our opinion, better decisions, they've got difficult decisions to make. Um, and then in innovation, which is, I suppose, my first love, um, I just want to go through two quick case studies, and I think got six minutes left. So the first is in Nepal. Um, and if anyone's been to Nepal, we know that people, this is actually taken from Sierra Leone, but we know that assistive technologies, we know that people, we want them to be possible for that people can just do what they need to do, right? And yet we can't get them to people globally, right? So this, this example is from Koala who, who do bespoke prosthetics upper limb, but they we can't seem to ship enough uh, prosthetics around the world. And also we can't um, make them bespoke enough for certain conditions. So we're trying to get assistive technologies that are affordable, that reach people. And we're also trying to get services that reach people and ensure that the tech when they get them enables them to do what they want to do. So to do that we're in in um, in Nepal, we started a thing called Enabling Fridays, where we just invited people. It's a two year engagement, but at the beginning we just invited people. You see all of those logos at the bottom, if, if you can see Digifactory, Namaste, Limb Solutions, the Limb Care Nepal, the University, Kathmandu University, Maker Lab, Digifactory, anybody that was working in manufacturing innovation or um, prosthetics um, or, or assistive technology were invited. Um, and we, we just had these Fridays where people came and talked about what they would like to be able to do in, in Nepal. How could we support globally from global expertise, the local infrastructure to build uh, resilience within the local infrastructure? And effectively, what came out of that was, well, we want local design and manufacturing. So we've got a local design and manufacturer company. We then also had a local clinic. We had a local occupational therapist practitioner. We had Kathmandu University and we had this global 80-20-30 team, which is not just UCL and GDI Hub, but also the University of Limerick. So we have discovered that we thought we'd start working on these bespoke designs. So Dan, for example, is a Kathmandu resident with ankle disarticulation via diabetes uh, from the Limb Care Clinic. And I'm not going to speak about him, but I'm going to speak about Hasrath, who was a Kathmandu resident with a partial hand amputation with, from the Limb Care Clinic. So these, so these Limb Care Clinic were coming up and saying to us, look, we've got these people that we can't help. Can you, can you help us? So here, here he is, uh, he's 18 years old. At 16, he lost a partial part of his hand. And you can see there, he is just left with uh, his small finger um, and, and sort of part of his thumb. It was crushed in an injection molding machine. He currently sews and helps out his father's business. What he wants to be able to do is sewing. He wants to be able to do light driving and, and tractor operation. That's, that's where, that's what he would like to be able to do. So we use the Canadian Occupational Therapy Performance Model we take specific partial hands measurements, so the functional measurement. We get limb care to do a clinical evaluation. We also interview the participant on what they want to do. And then we take the anatomical data collection. And then we basically do design criteria setting. So this just shows a mirror board where we're looking at um, the activities of daily living criteria, the biomechanical criteria, the product design criteria. Um, and we go through this with, with, the, with the person who's, who's going to get the um, prosthetic. Um, and then we begin to look at existing designs, both from the literature and elsewhere. Uh, look at some ideation stages where we begin to think about what, what could work, what can we make locally and, and what won't work. Um, and then we begin to look at, say, mechanical options. So this is an example of a mechanical hand, which was tried and liked to, to an extent. Um, so the video there, so you can see that our person is actually beginning to use the hand, like showing well, we begin to use the hand. But from the feedback of that, there were parts of the device where we'd like it to be softer, uh, parts of the device where we'd like additional function. So we're now at this physical prototyping stage of trying to develop um, the, the full hand. And that will be done, completed before Christmas. And then from Christmas next year, for a full year, we will track how this is used and how or when it needs repair, uh, what goes well, what doesn't go well. We would do that for five other products. And the idea is that we will have built um, the capacity to know in the local team how to make bespoke products, but also the capacity to track progress and, and, and understand the repair life cycle and begin to understand that digital um, digital manufacturing work stream for uh, assistive products. 
Um, just very quickly, I'll mention, mention a second case study, which is around disability interactions. So disability interactions is, is within something called human computer interactions, that's just how we interact with uh, computers, with humans, any sort of technology, design and innovation, and disability interactions sits in that space. And it has a, a sort of a concept that disabled people or persons with disability interact with their technology. Together, they then interact with the world. With the technology, the capabilities of the person are increased and together the person with the technology can overcome the barriers, the accessibility barriers that exist uh, globally. So we follow this double diamond approach in design, which is very much around discover, define, we've then got the design problem, develop and deliver. Um, but it doesn't always work like that, right? So it's sort of, you discover something and then you have to define it and then you realize you have to go back to discover a bit more and then you move into develop and you realize you need to go back to define and keep going backwards and forwards. And one of the products we're about to launch is an, an idea of Tassilia. Um, and Tassilia came from observations in schools in India where geography or STEM subjects just aren't taught well. And they're not taught well because nobody has resources. People can't see them. So that if you ask a child in India to draw a blind child to draw a tree, they'll often draw a circle. And that's because they might have hugged a tree. So their concept of a tree is, is round. Um, so then trying to learn STEM subjects is very difficult. So we had a lot of focus groups discussions. We looked at all of the tactile display just technologies that were out there. We ran design workshops with blind and partially sighted people in India. We began then to look at use cases for this new tactile interface. We looked at product architectures of all these tactile interfaces, and we developed a sort of archetypal user of, of our device. And at that point, we had our problem statement. And from there, we began to develop a whole new shape memory alloy material. So if we could have one material that was cut, that could then be raised and lowered with heat, we'd be able to get rid of all these moving parts, which would reduce the cost um, and make it more affordable uh, in low and middle income countries. And since then, we have developed an erasable tactile drawing pad. We've developed the concept of pixel art on it. We've developed the idea of a tactile printing display. And we now have a prototype of this refreshable uh, tactile display. So we've now answered this question of how might we design an affordable, refreshable tactile display technology for braille and tactile graphics. Um, and we've got some videos of, of these working. These are the prototypes working. People in India are just being able to draw on it initially and um, being able to figure out how it works, oh. like that we're actually oh, making yeah, yeah, yeah. the right yeah. shapes, so <laughs> to feel them. But now we've built it into a printer. So you can literally just print your own images and it uses an old CD laser to, to print those images for you. So in a classroom, you can just print the images ahead of class, for example, and then the students can write on them with heat and they can rub them off like an Etch-a-Sketch and they, they can start again. So that's it. Um, hopefully that was a bit of a rapid tour, but together uh, we can change the world. So let's make it happen. And uh, you can get me on those things. I will admit to being rubbish on social media, uh, but I will answer email if you email me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Holloway. That was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and open it up to uh, any questions uh, from the audience. And the first question is from Hank Dorkin, uh, MD. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, given the global approach and the countries currently involved, can one assume that language is not a barrier to implementation of these educational and technical resources? Is the information available in, uh, in other than English? If so, how was the translation funded accomplished and are more languages being considered? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad the presentation was OK. Um, so uh, just to give an example of a project that I didn't include here is a, a project on mobile as assistive technology. So the idea being that your mobile phone now uh, contains a lot of uh, technology that, that acts as an assistive technology. So, for example, it will speak to you, it will translate text to speech, speech to text. It has screen readers, it has it has magnifying glass, it has lots of other things. And so we got a, a small grant from Google to buy phones. And now we're we've got 200 phones being delivered in three countries. Um, and we're also doing a special project on um, one of Google's um, apps called Google Relate. So Google Relate app was actually developed mostly for the with American people um, under the, for people with ALS or motor neuron disease. So you've got dysartic speech and it will interpret now your dysartic speech and it will, it will translate it into text. It's a fantastic piece of kit. It works pretty much, you know, very well. Um, however, it, they launched it in Ghana, 
Google launched it in Ghana. And we were like, oh, that's interesting, launched it in Ghana. It's it all the usual countries, you know, Australia, UK, US, you know, Canada, and then Ghana. So we had a small project where we went to Ghana and we asked speech and language therapists, did they know this existed? So firstly, nobody knew it existed. Uh, secondly, when they did know it was existed, we trained the speech and language therapists, 10 of them. There were only 50 speech and language therapists the whole of Ghana, just to put it into context, right? And then the, and that's gone up from 10 about five years ago. So they, there's only they, so we've trained twenty you percent know, of the speech and language therapists in a week, and then we um, they then trained twenty participants using this app. But the problem is that, as you say, even in Ghana, people speak English, but they don't speak American English. They speak Ghanaian English, which has a different language structure. It has different patterns. There's different idiogram, um, idioms. There's there's just different things there. Also, it turns out if you want it to go from text to speech. The only person, the only voice that is available currently is an American woman in her 30s. So it doesn't matter if you're an African man in your 40s. <laughs> you will sound like an American woman in your 30s. But also we heard people say things like, oh, it's making it's making my English better. And I'm thinking it's not making your English better. It's changing how you speak. So you're trying to become more American, which shouldn't be the case. Does that make sense? And it also then doesn't pick up on, on some Ghanaian uh, English. Now, Google are very much aware of this problem. They're working, they've, they've even invited us to, to present to them, to, to the development team and, and to their wider team just last week. And they are trying to work on it. They already know some of these things are, are a problem and they're trying to make them available for more languages. But oftentimes the language problem for large language models is that the data sets that we have predominantly are American or European English as a starting point. And so we have this bias. So we need better data sets in order to build better English models. There are other problems with English uh, being the only language, but um, yeah, but most laws are not in English. They're in local languages and um, they're implemented in local languages. Um, yeah, it's just not, we don't have enough budgets for the assistive technology. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> the next question is from our own professor Vinod Nambodi. Uh, Dear Kathy, your global approach is awesome. I have a few questions, three questions. What are GDI Hub's sources of funding? That's the first question. Second, what advice can you give to someone wanting to take their AT research program onto the global stage? And finally, how does one go about becoming a WHO Global Collaborative Center on AT? So our source of funding, so I'll separate it into two. Um, within the community interest company, um, we are still probably about 70% funded by UK aid money uh, because we have this massive 80-20-30 programme that sort of um, masks everything else. Our other sources of funding within GDI Hub, uh, CIC, the community interest company, are some private training. So, for example, British Telecom have asked us to do, or BT asked us to do training on inclusive design for their whole team. So, you know, we did a, a, a MOOC for them on that. Uh, but also consultancy for people like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, um, so a lot of the development bank uh, agencies. There's also some uh, income streams from research grants where people are looking for the impact partner on a research grant because we're very good at impact delivery. So they're putting in a grant on a new prosthetic limb, but they want some community in, in, um, involvement and they will pay uh, this the company to run that co-design or, or co-development stuff. So there's multiple uh, uh, sources of income there. Um, on the ARC, the Academic Research Centre, it's pretty much the same as any university. So I'm, I'm the academic director. We, you know, mostly, like most places, we make most money from international students on our master's programme, followed by home students on our master's programme, uh, followed by some, uh, but just research grants. So, you know, our portfolio is mostly engineering and physical sciences research council within the UK um, uh, system. Uh, some Horizon 2020 funding from, from the European Commission. Um, yeah, and, and other sort of research grants. So those research grants fund our academic team along with the teaching and, and then our innovation and and, and, and other work is, is funded via aid money predominantly or development uh, funds at the moment. The second question, um, I don't know what you mean by programme, if it's a, a teaching programme. Uh, so maybe you can clarify while I um, come to your third question, which is about a WHO Global Collaborating Centre. I mean, start with you need a relationship with the WHO, which is not as difficult to get as you might think. Um, you need to be useful to them. 
So they need things. They will give you no money. So the one thing is you don't get paid at all. You cannot receive money uh, to, to be a WHO collaborating centre. So you need to be able to sign a document that says you have no investments or your university has no investments in the arms or tobacco. And you need to be able to, to develop a work plan, which basically complements their work plan, where you will do some work for free um, and, and that you will be able to support them uh, in that journey. For us, it was slightly easier. Well, it, it, I didn't even know collaborating centres existed when I when I pretty much every step of my career. I haven't known really what I was going to do and I had to get on with it and then something else happens. But I had no idea collaborating centres existed until um, I started working with the WHO. And then we were doing a lot of work to support the global report. And then they said, look, you, you know, this this would be a, a, the equivalent of being an, a collaborating centre. So would you like to be one? Um, yeah, if, 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 there's, there's, a, there's a list of collaborating centres uh, globally. Uh, can dig it out the list where where it exists and, and and I suppose you need to find a niche that that is speaks to to your uh, capability that nobody else has and then find the group within WHO who um, would want that research capacity and then have a conversation uh, with them. So when it comes to need a club, oh, yeah. So uh, in terms of programs, um, if you want to bring things globally, uh, maybe you can reach out to me after this and I can give you a bit more advice, but. It's like anything, it's partnership building. Um, you need to find somebody who wants whatever the program is <laughs> that you're offering. You need to be able to sell that program. Um, you, you need to be able to answer one of their needs. Um, generally speaking, people are very receptive. It's just trying to find the money to, to, to do that and, and, and building that trust. So I always think that you start small uh, when no money. I try to start every collaboration when no money changes hands. I hate having to deal with UCL research contracts. So I, I try to avoid it like the plague. Um, and so we just do things so where it's, you know, I, I will give a week of my time, you will give a week of your time, we're going to run a workshop together, for example, and you get to know each other through that. Um, you, you get to see if they're going to put stuff in as well, because not everyone might have money, but they might have other types of capital that they can give. Um, and, and so, you know, you might be the person bringing the money, they might be the person bringing the opportunity or, or whatever that might be. And then we build to a small research grant which won't need so many signatures. And then eventually we apply for money together to do something bigger. So we have a, that sort of model at GDI. So no money, pilot, big. And um, at pilot, we're both putting a bit of money in, but it's low. And then at, at, at big, we, we've applied for money together. I hope that answers your question. Great, uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Mohammed Saad. Um, when it comes to the need of collaborators, what is the top, GDI hub innovation project or technologies on the list? Yeah, at the moment, it it's, um, seems to be, can you help us grow an innovation ecosystem in our country? Um, so most countries want to be able to manufacture or produce locally. It's really difficult to import and export assistive technology. It's just very difficult. We, we're yet to get a moratorium on taxes and import and export duties, which I think should be something that should exist globally, but, but it doesn't exist yet. And so therefore, even if you innovate in Kenya and you want to export to Uganda, it's it's difficult, right? Um, it's not impossible, but it, but it's difficult. Um, so people tend to want to set up. And, and then if you go to countries, say, for example, like Rwanda, they've had a wonderful recovery from, from a, a very difficult past. And, and they now have a, an incredibly well-educated population, but too few jobs. So they want jobs. So they what they want is an innovation ecosystem that will allow people to design and create. So at the moment, we're doing a lot of work to help, whether it be you know in Rwanda or, or Ghana or somewhere else, where people want to, to build their own innovation ecosystem. That tends to be one of the big things. The second big thing is inclusive infrastructure. Can't tell you how many people are after us for climate inclusive infrastructure, that, that nexus. Um, and, the, and the third, I think, is our, our ability to, to co-design and advocate. Um, so people do come to us looking to be, a, you know, an advocacy partner or, or a co-design um, partner. Um, yeah, I think that hopefully answers the question. Thank you so much. Um, I do have one question, if I could jump in. Um, really fascinated by your cross-national comparison of countries from Latin America to Asia and Africa. Um, and I was wondering, is there any one country that has stood out um, as being the most receptive to your work in terms of trying to collaborate, not only collaborate, but trying to ensure that your projects and the technologies are sustainable and enduring over time? Um, has there been any country that sort of stands out as sort of a model among your countries uh, in terms of government commitment to those things? 
Yeah, I, I mean, we have a good, we have a good and long established rela relationship in Kenya, where we have run the AT in Innovate Now program, which is the first uh, accelerator for assistive technology. So I think we've now supported 49 ventures. And like one of our first ventures that we supported has now set up a co-design lab, for example, for blind and partially sighted people, as well as a distribution network for assistive technologies in, in Kenya. Um, so we have a good program that, and we do we do a lot of research work there so we have um i've had an established whether it be with um uh, jacuat which is a jomo kenyatta university for agriculture and technology or or, or um university of nairobi we you know we have a lot quite good relationships there as well as with ngos so we, we've done probably our most work i would say in kenya um in indonesia there's been a lot of reception to the inclusive design work and climate resilience work because they're so at risk of, of climate uh, problems um, and Sierra Leone is surprisingly receptive. I, I've never been to a country that has so many challenges. I often, when I go to Sierra Leone, I, I really do like, worry about how we can make an impact because, you know, a can of Coke costs more there than it does anywhere else in the world, I reckon, because everything has to be imported. You, know, you run out of a notebook, it's going to cost you $10 to get a notebook. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're thinking you're trying to help, you know, people get assistive technology in this for what? Like, to do what <laughs> like, so and so you do for the why but that being said the and i would say this with the rwanda as well the the rwandan government and the sierra leonean governments are i think exceptional in their ability to work together across departments and to really and and to want to work across the ecosystem so they bring a lot of people together you, you know in other countries you can get that sort of infighting but you don't get that you don't get that there um so answer your question Ed. That, that's great, uh, really very interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the next question from the audience is uh, from an anonymous attendee. That is, how and in what ways has this initiative, initiative benefited people with hidden disabilities? What are programs, et cetera, that are out there for those of us that suffer? Yeah, that's a great question, anonymous attendee. Um, so uh, the 802030 program, in all honesty, has not done much. That's the honest answer. We have other programs which I've not mentioned. So, for example, I run a project called Impact in in um, in which is funded by uh, EPSRC, um, and in that program we are trade we are working with a panel of disabled people, some of whom have hidden disabilities, um, to develop. Uh, how do we make the research culture more inclusive? That's both for academics that have hidden disabilities, but also for the, uh, the hit, well, people, whether they be academics or not, have come together. So you've got some innovators, you've got some social entrepreneurs, you've got some academics. Everybody in the group has uh, a disability of some kind, uh, some of whom have multiple disabilities. And we're trying to figure out how we help each other um, in terms of uh, growing our, our careers. Um, in the next, of that 31 million that's coming, I have managed finally to get a budget line around um, trauma and mental health. So I, I personally am very interested in uh, childhood trauma with, and, and the link within neurodiversity, but also mental health in, in later life. And a lot of disability is, is you know, we get in, in Gaza right now, there's going to be a lot of disability, right? A lot of people are going to lose limbs, but they're going to lose limbs very traumatically. Um, and therefore, there's not going to be just limb loss. There's going to be severe mental health um, problems a, as well. And so how do we begin to evolve from that? Um, we have been acutely aware within 80 20, 30 that we haven't done uh, very much for um, for hidden disabilities. Um, and, and I think that's because there was a need to start with what was known, if that meant, well, with the physical and sensory to get to, to the point of being able to then move into um, hidden disabilities. But um, yeah, personally, you know, I, I am, um, yeah, I have uh, two, two hidden conditions, uh, and also had a breakdown in 2016 before I started GDI Hub. So I am very uh, aware of the need for these things. So don't think that it's not on our agenda. It has been. It's also just been the pace that you have to um, build the momentum, and start sometimes with the easier questions because you, you know you have to get to the point where you can then tackle the harder questions. So. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> the next question is from um, uh, Yunus uh, Dosumu. And uh, um, Yunus says, thanks for the presentation. Please, how is GDI ensuring persons with disabilities are reached in the hard to reach rural communities? Yeah, um, well, 
<laughs> the truth is, like I just said, you know, we try to build momentum. So oftentimes rural communities are not, um, we're not working so closely with them at the start. That's not to say we don't know that they exist. So things like the the VATA, the population health surveys, we would they would have been they would have occurred in all types, whether it be uh, urban, peri-urban, or rural. Um, but we also know that some of the some of the innovations that we have backed do work for that uh, remote setting. So, for example, we've backed before Amparo, which is a kit for developing assistive uh, developing prosthetic limbs, where you can go to the person and, and in in the rural community, and you can fit a prosthetic limb within two hours rather than the person having to come into clinic and, and then go back. So we find that, that, that travel time is particularly problematic because even if you give people money for the travel, they can't afford to take the time off work. So, you know, people have absolutely no um, no flex in, in their finances. So, you know, it, the whole part of that, that has to be captured and, and then they won't come back to the limb after six weeks. It, it, things will have moved on. You won't get it to them. So we have back some innovations that would do that. We also are trying to work. So we've got a conversation happening, for example, with, you know, other countries that are beginning to do more. So, for example, the um, Rwanda, the government of Rwanda has now instilled a, a disability innovation or disability inclusion expert. So digital expert, I suppose, would be the best part of things. So I'm a digital expert in each community. So it doesn't matter how rural in each tiny bit of district, you now have this digital expert because they're trying to get everyone to move on to mobile, move mobile banking, you know, mobile services. And so now we're going to work to see what well, we're talking about the possibility of maybe trying to work with those that those community people to understand disability inclusion and understand, for example, the apps that are available on Android or understand, for example, the services that are available. So, um, yeah, I would say we don't do massive amounts, but we do do some bespoke uh, amounts. Great. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, and it looks like final question is, um, I live in the USA and I am a member of the UK site patients in Europe seems to be so much more acceptable to those of us with disabilities. The USA seems to be always fighting the big health insurance companies. Has the insurance business in America made inroads hard? <laughs> My personal opinion, not GDI Hub's opinion, is that the USA pays an awful lot of money of its GDP to health. And that is not necessarily true in other countries. So I met uh, one of our students this year is a wheelchair user with, with a particular condition. She comes from the United States and she said she couldn't believe the National Health Service. She'd heard these horror stories. She came over here within, she, she registered with a GP. She told her GP her condition. Within a week, somebody had wronged her to make sure that she had her drugs. Various things were done. She said, you've no idea the amount of admin I do in the States. And the company she used to work for is one of the big tech companies who had one of the best insurance policy. And still it was a nightmare. Right. And she's like, honestly, the NHS is much better. And um, the NHS has its downfalls, too. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's, uh, it's been chronically underfunded for at least 10 years. So it has it is creaking. But I do think that um, the insurance, I personally wouldn't replicate the insurance model. And, but it is being peddled. You know, it is peddled to people as an option um in, in low middle income countries um and i i do worry personally about that because i, I don't think it's I, th I think at some point we need a rebalancing of who's making the profit and, and where the money should be distributed um within society i mean i don't think you should be bankrupt because you have a health condition um or because you have an accident and you didn't have the right insurance so um whereas for example in in south africa they have a tax a road tax as you're driving each mile you're driving there's money that's going into a pot that pays out Centrally, if you have an accident, you know, so there are different models that we could be looking at. You don't necessarily need to copy the United States of America, um, or you could take elements of the United States of America and mix them with, with other elements. Um, but yes, I would say it has, in short, but I'm sure other people would not like that answer. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, that, that, that's a great. Uh, any, any further questions, please feel free. We have a little more time um, from the audience. I'll give it a few seconds here. In the meantime, I really love the global perspective uh, in your research and <clears throat> comparing <clears throat> comparing these different countries, but just really emphasizing the need for the WHO and other, you know, the international community to work with countries on this on this issue. I mean, I completely agree. As someone who also works in resource poor countries, that you know these issues are very neglected, um, and so I really find your research to be so important and and, and illuminating. Um, 
see, there are no other further questions here. Um, unless, oh, Dean Dolan does have a question. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, Dr. Holloway, thank you so much um, for this talk. I think it's fair to say uh, for much longer. Um, and I was glad to have the websites and the stuff to follow up on. Um, so in the College of Health, we are working to develop this strategic research cluster. We're really small. So the college overall, um, right now we're about halfway in terms of our build, in terms of faculty hires. We will at full strength have about 55 faculty. Um, and this research cluster is gonna be much smaller, 10 to 12 faculty, and we're trying to take a multidisciplinary approach. And so listening to the scope of what you do, I maybe am feeling a little bit like you described feeling when you go to Sierra Leone, like how can we have impact? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think one way that I've started to think about that is um, what are the sort of um, criteria for where we get involved? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I realized, you know, I can't ask you, where, what should we do with 10 to 12 faculty, you know? Um, and right now we have a few, some working in autism um, and especially the transition to adult care. Um, and then Vinod Nambudari, who you heard from, who works in vision loss um, and creating indoor wayfinding systems. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's not just for people with vision loss is indoor wayfinding. It, it, um, it, uh, potentially impacts multiple populations who have other issues like cognitive and mobility. So I don't know, I guess I'm not asking you to brainstorm a little bit. Um, where would we go for thinking about the criteria as we're continuing to hire faculty and, you know, trying to focus a bit more perhaps? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean- It's a very it's a fair question really, but I'm curious. No, no, I'm happy to, happy to brainstorm with you. I, I think when we started, um, we were lucky that Vicky, Ian and I had enough overlap for each thing. So it turned out that Vicky's uh, first degree, I think, is economics and politics. And, and she'd been in social development, but sort mm -hmm. of uh, regional development within the UK. She'd worked for the mayor of London for, for Boris Johnson. And then she worked you know, for the Paralympics. And hilariously, one of our first conversations was me explaining that when I was trying to do wheelchair biomechanics work, I had, had stumbled across Amatia Sen's work on, on capability models. And I, I'd always been very interested in this idea of, I, I was always been a reluctant engineer, if I'm honest. Uh, like I, you know, like the sort of so what really annoyed me. Like I remember I, I must have nearly dropped out of my degree nearly every year because I was like, well, they're just trying to make us make other people more efficient. And that just makes everyone more miserable. And so I'm just going to be like this, you know, harbor of misery <laughs> while I get paid money. right? Um, and so I don't really want to do that. Um, and and I suppose I got attracted to Amatia Sen's work. So I was thinking, well, how do we think about disability in terms of increasing capabilities? And, and, and how do we do that at an individual, but also a national center? And, and she and I had this great conversation where she might have been the only person in the world, I think, who really, she was very excited about my uh, PhD, uh, where I don't think anybody else ever was, really. I think most people thought it should be more biomechanics or more transport or more something. But this I I kept pushing this idea of capabilities through the PhD. And and then my PhD had been on outdoor environments. And I did a lot of work on, I, I you know, the stuff I couldn't mention today, but I, I, I helped design the, the, the London, the deep tube train and, and, and high speed rail too. And wow. also did work with people with them. Um, with uh, uh, macular degeneration, for example, or different types of dementia, and try to figure out what, well, how do they interact with the environment, and what you know, how do we make the environment more um, more accessible to them? And so I had done some work on inclusive design, but it was very much transport. And then Ian was an inclusive design person, so we had this like Venn diagram where mm. we each talked. We we had enough of we understood enough, and, and Ian and Vicky had worked together for, for five seven years or something to deliver the the London twenty twelve uh, legacy um or the twenty twelve games and then the legacy. So we had this ability to talk to talk each other. There was a bit of a magic. We call it the magic in the middle. What was our magic in the middle? Like you know, and, and our magic yeah. in the middle was we were sick. I was so tired of having conversations with like policy makers who would blame transport people who would blame you know medics. Well, try and get medics and transport people in the same room and you might as well just bash your head off a wall like nobody you know they they wouldn't speak to each other they would just you know talk mm -hmm. at each other so we thought well that's that's our usp right our usp is how do we bring people together and do the things like this co-design of, of things and, and and so our our that was our usp so i think 
you know, if, if you're looking at, um, I, I don't know, you, you know, your position as well, but I suspect you've got strengths. Um, you must have strengths. Right? There must be things yep. that you have. So, you know, you, you, for example, autism, you know, I, I just mentioned that we haven't done as much as I would like in, in hidden disabilities. Well, you're working in autism. Um, uh, and I also think there's something about, you know, you had the idea of independence. I, I do wonder genuinely if you, you might consider interdependence because independence, yeah. you know, you in the United States, but and that's very independence is a thing right it's like a yeah you know, like a capitalist yeah, yeah, yeah. ideal but actually none yeah, of yeah. Us it's, also, it's less right? so ableist is the problem yeah it is a yeah. little bit right so you know it's we're not so independent yes yeah. like, so we, we, we know we need to change it, made so. by yeah. somebody else with a pair of glasses that were given to him by somebody right. else right? there is no so, independence so really. none of us are actually yeah. independent and actually this idea of interdependence um and how because if you look yeah. at your work you know when i'm in my community role of like with other disabled people like you know we're talking about how we're helping each other all the time and then you, I turn to the mm-hmm. academic role and it doesn't quite yet translate. I'm trying to make it translate, but it's still hard, right? Because you have these conversations that are yeah. still quite academic. And, and so you have to, you're still playing that role, if you like. And, and it, you, you're holding that tension that you're not maybe being as open as, as you'd like to be. Or you have to wait maybe for people to be accepting of what you might want to say. So I think that, um, I think that this idea of, yeah, to trying to work beyond disciplinary impairment boundaries I think is important you know I I think I think that really does then speak to a a more social model or biopsychosocial model of disability and at the moment the ICF model just speaks to functioning right if you look at the ICF model functioning is very well defined right my eyesight (laughs) deficiency is like (laughs) but nobody like yeah the environmental things you know there are five codes (laughs) you know so Although it says it's a social model, and I do appreciate, you know, Tom Shakespeare works at LSHGM and, you know, that global, you know, the global report on disability, fantastic world report on disability that he he edited and talking about this biopsychosocial report. But then when you actually go to implementation, and I have very good friends who are medics, you know, the world around, it's still, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> You know, and, and you yeah. are an orthopedic surgeon. That is what you know. That is what you are. Um, and so it's and and you do appreciate that your patient, uh, you know, has a life outside of your, you know, operating theatre. But ultimately, your job is to operate on this person. So, uh, yeah, I think there's something around that idea of maybe if that helps. I don't know. Um, yes, I mean that helps a lot actually because some of our strengths are in working with communities, for example, not necessarily yet you know, people with disabilities, but that's an area we're hiring in right now. So, um, so I also appreciate the comment both on the name and on um, the definition, right, as a more sort of functional, maybe you want to think more about a behavioral social definition. So yeah, super helpful. Uh, I had a couple of slides that I didn't show, which I could show, but they were like, just pictures of us, you know, 2016, 2018, 2020. And, um, and, you know, in 2016, there's me, Ian and Vicky sitting on a train. I could show them quickly if you want, but uh, and then yeah. there's us. Go quickly. Show I mean, we'd love that if, if you don't mind. Got a few minutes. No more questions, so we'll just. We, uh, we have plenty of time. Yeah, we're not we're not taking anybody's question time. time. I don't think so. Great. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hold on. It's just not. Oh yeah. There you go. Share. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of slides because I need to get to the one. Yeah. Here it is. Right. So as I mentioned, it was like 2012. Thanks to the warm up, I had nothing to do with it. 2015 this was a, a mock-up tube train um and so if you imagine vicky this is vicky you can't really see her very well it's taken on a mobile phone camera back in 2015 and this is ian and here they're telling us about the paralympic legacy uh paralympic opolis is what ian was calling it at the time um and this is my research mm-hmm. team and at the time we were running these experiments for transport for london where we had hundreds of people get on and off this train hundreds of time wearing different cap colors and we were deciding different door widths different seating arrangements what would be the best flow different step heights different gaps between the platform and so even vicky says it's quite funny she went to tufnell park which is north london and it's an industrial estate and then there's like this warehouse and then she opened the warehouse and there's this tube and carriage which she really you know wasn't expecting and we had this research meeting and i don't know what i was meant to do after this research meeting i'm sure i was meant to do something because these experiments were right in the middle but i actually ended up taking a bus with vicky and ian back down for 40 minutes to central London uh, only to get back on the bus and come back up because the discussion was really exciting to me I was like this could be something different I don't know what it is and and I suppose that's the the thing I would say to you um Beth uh is that I don't I didn't know where that would lead right I just knew I was excited so that was an exciting conversation so I didn't want it to stop 
And in 2016, this is um, the National Paralympic Day, the mayor of, of London, um, Sadiq Khan, that's me, this is, you know, some other people around, and, and we launched the concept of GDI Hub, and it was a concept. We'd got £10,000 out of UCL as part of their 2030 vision money, and we'd got it matched by the London Legacy Development Corporation, and we ran a week of events where we invited anybody. We didn't care who you were, if you were a charity, an individual, a school, we didn't care. If you were coming to the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, come and join us for a week of brainstorming. And we sort of divided it. So we had an entire workshop on skin as an interface where you had some people from London College of Fashion talking to some orthopedic yeah. surgeons. To, you know, we had one on like, we had a group of autistic children designing wheelchair services for people in Tanzania, which was definitely the most fun uh, if you looked at it from the outside. And we had, so and they were all random. Like, why do that? Well, it was because Maria Kett happened to be involved and she needed to brainstorm this thing in Tanzania. And the school got involved saying they wanted their, you know, these guys to be involved. So we went, well, let's just put them together and see what happens. Right? <laughs> we don't know. Like, they could come up with something that we haven't thought of, which they did. Lots of things we haven't thought of. There's also lots of broken wheelchairs. But we ran this week of events. <laughs> at the end, we thought, well, you know, what could it be? And there's it's academics, there's loads of debate, like, should it be called global, should it be called London, should it be disability, should it be diversity, you know, should it be innovation, should it be inclusion, should it be a hub, should it be a centre, different rules around the word centre within UCL, but eventually we landed on a GDI hub, but in 2016 that was it, it was an idea, like, it was just an idea, me, Vicky and Ian had three full-time jobs, we didn't, you know, that was it, um, so we just launched this as an idea, um, and then after that, um, in 2017, we managed to get a little bit of money, um, which we applied for, like a you know sort of an, a, like an exploratory grant. I think it was forty thousand pounds at the time, and that allowed us to do one research project, a small research project uh, on prosthetics. And then we flew. We had one day where we flew. This is Maria Kett, one of the co-founders, Ian, uh, myself, and Vicky. Um, and this is Chapal Knapsis, who's the head of was the previous head of assistive technology at the WHO. And we had one day, Metropal at UCL. who was giving a talk. And I just went along and said to him afterwards, oh, we got this idea of GDI Hub. I wanted, wanted to pick your brains on it. He said, well, why don't you come to Geneva and pick my brains? And I went, oh, OK, fine. So we flew there. One day. We were still putting the presentation together on the plane because we had no time. Right? We just flew one day, got the 6 a.m. flight out of City Airport, arrived in Geneva. And we booked like these appointments with people like UNICEF, the ICRC, the you know International Labour Committee, things I'd never heard of, if I'm honest. And so we just went and we just talked about what we knew and then we got this. Um, but he was the one who bit and he said, this would be really good. This could be, I, you know, I've been trying to get a momentum change. This could be a momentum change. And it was the continued conversations with Chapal that led us to put this bid in for 80 2030. And we happened to be in Tokyo because we thought the Olympics was going to happen, Paralympics. We didn't realise COVID was coming. Um, and so the British Council had flown us out there to do some work with them. And this was, I'm a classic academic, so I the minute I got Wi-Fi that day I checked my emails <laughs> we've been out all day so I checked my email and we were being sent to this uh we're in the museum um and we got uh we brought to this museum and it overlooks Tokyo and it's a, it's beautiful and I should really be looking at this and that and I'm actually just checking my email and I looked at his email but oh this this looks like we've got 10 million pounds so I got to Ian and I'm like Ian Ian quick I think we need to find Vicky where's Vicky find Vicky and this will tell you a lot about me Vicky and Ian I've already checked my email so I find out I then say, I think this email says we've got 10 million pounds. Vicky does a, oh my God, what we can do. I've got a little gif of her going, oh my God, did we actually land this 10 million pounds? And Ian turns around and goes, shit, I don't think we've got a bank account. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, that was the start of, you know, the journey because before the, the money that we'd got before the 40,000 pounds, we didn't like a UK aid now say they were kept waiting for us to invoice, but we were too busy. And technically Vicky and Ian couldn't take a wage. I didn't want a wage. And everybody else was just giving their time pretty much for free. So we didn't, we were just, the contract was just to allow us to do the work, you know? So yeah, so we we did that. And then this was the the image that we sent to our team on WhatsApp, which was the moment we found out we got the 31 million. Uh, and this is our new chief operating officer. And this is Vicky uh, with the minister at, in, at um, UN, at the United Nations, where he announced um, um, that he, he was supporting us to 31 million. What I like, if I had it in this presentation, but I don't, but the wider angle of that shot will show that there were two other people from GDI Hub. So as an institution, we did not fly the three directors to the United Nations. Um, Vicky represented us, but we were represented by two PhD students. Uh, one is Anna Landre, who's done some fantastic work with community development, like getting assistive technology, not part of GDI Hub, but before she joined GDI Hub, 
getting assistive technology people in Ukraine, for example, before the UN agencies were able to do that. And the second PhD student is uh, Jamie Daymar, who is our data population health expert. And she was the one who helped support the WHO and all of the RATA data. And so from our point of view, we like we are really intentional about building the, the next generation. So they need to understand what it's like to be at someone like the United Nations. And, and the three of us now know that. So in any one, so we're about to go to three big major events now. And in each of those major events, one of the directors flies with one member of staff that's not the director does that make sense to be the PhD yeah, researcher or maybe even a project manager but we want to make sure that everyone's exposed to this type of thing early because they and also you know what academia is like I'm the PI of the grant I mean this right. stage on a 30 what's that mean I mean it means I'm, I mean I like what am I going to do show Jamie's work and go oh this right. is what population health I mean that's what Jamie did. I didn't, you know, I did. It, it's their work, and I want them to be known as the expert in that area because they need to grow their yeah. academic career to be the expert in, in in that area. So, yes, that's it. So I always show this because I think basically it's about uh, friendship as well as partnership, and and you know we can trust each other. So we, you know, there's been times where two of us have have mental health uh, conditions, um, and so there's always times where somebody's not at the best. Um, yeah, we're able to say. I'm really struggling this week. I could be like, I'm really struggling. Um, yeah. I find it really difficult to do that presentation. And, you know, when the other one will go, hang on, I can do that. That's, you know, I'm feeling great this week. <laughs> so let me do it. So it's quite nice to have that that ability to to share amongst us. So yeah, I think that's, that was all I was going to. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, it's a really compelling and inspiring mm -hmm. story. Um, I also love that it's, I don't know. It's clear that y'all are real people. I'm going to y'all you because um, I'm from the South, but it's, you know, you're real people making this happen. I think that makes it um, even more inspiring. So thank you so much. It looks like there's one more question, Ed. Oh, let me see here. This is from a student. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, one question from Kate Brown. Uh, thank you for your presentation. With the increasing use of artificial intelligence, how can this technology be used to expand the development of assistive technology? Hmm. I was asked that question recently by the Royal Society. And I said, if we do a good job, it's going to bring us closer together uh, and it's going, to, it's going to reduce the inequality gap. And if we do a bad job, <laughs> it's going to drive communities apart and, um, and, and, and make it less easy for people to get assistive technology. So... In terms of AI, as I said the example already of, of the Google Relate app, it's, it's not to pick on Google. Um, they're already doing an excellent job in accessibility. But if we only build technologies based on language models that are only in the global north, then obviously they're going to be biased towards the global north. That's that's what's going to happen, right? And that will be the same with image libraries and, and, and also just the design of technology, right? Like we often think about how we design technologies when I travel, um, that idea of interdependence is much more, you know, available. I, I, I was uh, uh, talking or I was teaching recently at IIT Madras. We were just chatting about social norms. And so for me, it would not be usual for me to, you know, to hear that, I don't know, two professors who are married with three kids and the two professors and three kids, they all share the same bed. And that's very normal to them. They're all teenagers, but they still all share the same bed because they all live in a two bedroom place where the grandparents, you know, live in another room. Now, in London, that would be quite bizarre. Does that make sense? Like it would just be a bizarre thing. And it, and in India, that's a very, very normal state of affairs. So if you were designing infrastructure, it's going to be very different, right? And it's the same with AI. If we if we bring our social norms to the development of technology, it, it those social norms are now being absorbed by AI, um, which is, is a problem, I think. Um, and so I think that we can, that being said, it can be revolutionary. So a $10,000 piece of kit, uh, an augmented or, or alternative communication aid can now be can, can now be um, sub, well, uh, replaced with a $150 phone and an internet connection. Um, so we have this opportunity to develop really excellent assistive technologies, whether it be you know new um, vision or haptic devices for visually impaired people, whether it be new automatic sign language. So if you think about sign language, interpretation there's something like a hundred sign language interpretations uh, interpreters in india um and there are how many languages in india lots of languages how many sign languages in india lots of languages just recently we held our um global disability summit we asked people which sign you know which sign language we should use what would they like so we got one vote for international one vote for american one vote for africa like kenyan i think one vote for indian and one vote for british sign language we ended up with international 
But what if you had something that could translate across all of them, right? Like that there shouldn't, we should just be able to translate. And I think that those assistive technologies in terms of innovation, something I didn't really get into is, is how we help ventures scale. And a lot of the ventures, what I try to help them think about is how can that core technology be used beyond the use case of disability? So if you think about um, if you think about uh, sign language interpretation or you think about glasses that are going to um, see for visually impaired people and give some haptic feedback, that's great. But that glasses could be doing translation. Right. So if you go into a restaurant, for example, and I went to Paris recently, my French was terrible. I would have loved things to be translated for me automatically. That would be great. And I know I can get my phone and I can try and do something, but it, it would it would be great that, that that could happen. So I think that AI has this phenomenal potential to, to change our lives. It is changing our lives already. We have to be very careful that we um, protect people, especially vulnerable people from, from, from how, how AI is, is being used. We also have to be careful that we know when AI is being used and, and when there's um, you know, when there's variability in the answers or, or, or uncertainty, how that uncertainty is, is given uh, to people so they can understand it. But if we do it right, it could be revolutionary. And 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 um, it's quite exciting. Fantastic! Well, thank you so much. That was wonderful, Professor Holloway. Um, no further. Doesn't are there any further questions? Seems like we might have uh, might be done with the questions here. If there are no further questions, I just want to thank you so much again for a wonderful presentation today, Professor Holloway. I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure all of us learned a great deal about this critical global issue. And, um, and I just, before we get going, I just wanted to quickly announce that our next uh, colloquium speaker series uh, will be on uh, February 6th at 12 p.m. Uh, Jay Logan Smilgis uh, of the University of British Columbia will be giving a presentation. And so please join us for that event. Um, once again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Holloway, for a wonderful discussion today. We look forward to learning more about your cutting edge and important global research. And we also uh, enjoy meeting your friend there. <laughs> <laughs> the Yogi Bear would just like to say thank you very much for having us. So um, we've enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a nice day. Take, Take care. care. Enjoy the bye rest bye. of your day, guys. Bye-bye.